Odds are you have heard someone refer to Ben Arfa as a wasted talent. But just how talented was he? And was it really his fault that his talent went to waste? Was there anything he could have done to save his career from the pit of mediocrity it ended up in? Well, hopefully today I'll show you the answer to all of that. So welcome to the life of Atem Ben Arfa, allegedly one of football's biggest wasted talents. From day one there were hints at the talent that Ben Arfa would have. His father Kamel worked in a foundry when he was born, but what many don't realize is that previous to this new life in France, Kamel was a football player in Tunisia and had even represented their national team. Hatem was a legacy. His destiny was buried deep in his DNA. By the age of seven, he would join his first football team and five years later he had already moved three times, but the fourth one would be the most essential to his development. The Clairefontaine Academy came calling, the same academy who had carved out talents like Nicolas Anelka and Thierry Henry, and that would eventually give the world Kylian Mbappé. Once Ben Arfa arrived, he wouldn't be the only recognizable name in the squad. Alongside him was Abu Diaby, and ironically, one major bit of foreshadowing would be supplied by the two of them. During their time there, a documentary providing insight that the life in the academy was shot and of course, to no one's surprise, they caught Abu Dhabi and Ben Arfa getting into a fight after repeatedly going back and forth about whatever their respective mom's profession was. Well, you know what I mean. Regardless, Ben Arfa shined through all this mess and just three years later, at 15 years of age, he was already believed to be the next one in line, the next French football star boy. Leon were so convinced of it that they offered 150,000 euros for his signing, an offer Atem would accept despite also being a target for Chelsea and Ajax. At Leon's academy he would once again be in great company, this time Karim Benzema. Together they would take Leon to the final of the under-16 French championship where Ben Arfa would score despite a defeat and just two years after joining forces the pair would be promoted to the first team. One other reason for their promotion to the first team would be their performance at the under-17 Euros with France. Both would score in the first match of the tournament and though Benzema would go on to be dropped for the rest of it, Ben Arfa would score in every match except for the final despite France still going on to win it all. As they joined the top tier, their paths would still stay aligned for a long time as both would not make it as regular starters from the get-go, playing as regular substitutes until their fourth season at the club. Then, both became essential pieces for the squad, with Benzema scoring goal after goal and getting his first few hat-tricks while Ben Arfa supplied all the magic. It seemed Leon had cooked up the perfect recipe for success, but then the issues came. Rumors began spreading that the duo was falling apart, something that would eventually gain some credibility as the clip of Benzema ignoring Ben Arfa made it to the public. To calm down the rumors, Leon offered Ben Arfa a contract extension and it worked for a while, but then it came crashing down so fast that it's hard to believe anyone was expecting it, if not for that one clip of Ben Arfa getting into a fight I mentioned earlier. There's not much to say about what happened besides that Ben Arfa got into a fight in training. He was deemed as the one at fault and out of nowhere a transfer move was upon us. It was said Man United, Arsenal and even Real Madrid were interested, but in the end it was sold to rivals Marseille for 12 million euros, which is a very odd choice that obviously led many to think that it was one he made out of spite as he felt he was being unfairly kicked out from the club. This one moment would prove to have incredible repercussions on his career. Just look where Benzema is now compared to Ben Arfa. The next season, Benzema would go on to continue impressing and would earn a move to Real alongside Ronaldo and Kaká, while Ben Arfa would have enjoyed a year of mediocrity, a year that started with yet another fight in training, this time with Gibril Cissé, and only 15 days after his transfer to Marseille was confirmed. His first 13 league matches would see him score 6 goals, a far higher frequency than what he was used to, but over that same period he got into 2 more fights, one of them involving the coach himself in a Champions League match as Ben Arfa refused to warm up. In a few months the guy who had to live out the fame of being the one kid who got into a fight in a documentary had made sure everyone was once again convinced he was in need of some anger management and of course the completely unremarkable rest of his season didn't help with his public perception. But one thing was sure, regardless of whether you believe his impact had much to do with that, Leon had won the league for every year he was with them, 
and as soon as he joined Marseille, they finished above Lyon. This would only become more impressive, as in his second season they handed him the number 10 shirt and he helped Marseille win the league for the first time in 18 years, though it must be said his first half of the season was pretty disastrous once again, with several controversies, but by the second half he would redeem himself as a new coach Didier Deschamps would praise him frequently, especially in February, as his incredible performances earned him a Player of the Month award. Regardless, by the end of the season, transfer rumors emerged once again. Some said Werder Bremen, some said Galatasaray or even AC Milan, but in the end, the one club who would take center stage was Newcastle. Marseille would go back and forth with the English club and it seemed that Ben Arfa lost his patience and knowing him as you know now, you're probably guessing it didn't go too well, and you'd be right. He boycotted training sessions, spoke directly to the press, ruined relationships with the staff, issued ultimatums, threatened to leave to England without the club's permission, and eventually it all worked. Marseille got so fed up with his antics that they just found a way to make it work with Newcastle and sent him on his way on a two million pound loan with a clause of five million that would make the move permanent. In England, there were hopes that the tricky winger would tear up the league and for 170 minutes, there was hope. But then, as he faced Manchester City, Nigel de Jong, who had already broken a player's leg and become infamous for his World Cup final tackle on Xavi Alonso, decided to add another victim to the list, breaking Ben Arfa's tibia and fibula in one single swoop. The FA and referee would somehow not see anything wrong with that, but the Netherlands coach would decide to drop him as punishment. Ben Arfa, on the other hand, would spend the next 265 days trying to come back from that injury. He would only get to come back to the pitch the following season and after a major scare as he injured his ankle in the preseason. Ben Arfa finally started regularly playing for the club, though he would clearly be in poor form, only scoring his first goal in late December. The second half of the season would be much better, with the winger bringing in 5 goals, but it wouldn't be the number of goals that would be surprising, but the way he scored them. On January 7th, he provided the type of goal you'd expect only from Messi, making it seem as if the ball was invisible to the Blackburn defenders, and then in April, against Bolton, he quite simply just ran in a straight line, almost from one box to the other, and somehow, when he did it, it just worked out. Newcastle finished 5th ahead of Chelsea and Liverpool, but the fans didn't care, they only cared that whenever they turned the TV on there was always hope of a moment of magic just like those. Before the start of the next season he would finally get to join France in an international tournament after having several of his controversies getting in the way of possible call-ups, but it wouldn't matter much as he would only get to play a bit over 60 minutes before the national team got knocked out of the tournament. His first season with Newcastle was promising and the fans could not wait to see what tricks their magic winger had up his sleeve for the second one, and he would have an amazing start, scoring the winning goal in the opening match against Tottenham and then getting an impressive weak foot long shot goal on the third match day of the season. By December, it had been confirmed that he was in some of the best form yet, but then an injury stopped him for three months. To make matters worse, he would get injured once again in his first match back and would be out for another month. By the time he was back, their initial streak of good form was far gone and the team would end the season only 5 points off of the relegation zone. His final season was the most underwhelming, Ben Arfa proved he would forever be just a fantasy in every fan's mind rather than an actual concrete footballer putting on numbers week in and out. The coaches grew tired of his lack of professionalism, his unreliability, and the other players found him selfish, a diva who could not be bothered with defensive work, something he was really never shy to admit. He frequently claimed modern tactics were killing the game and that the magic was slowly being sucked from the sport he loved. Regardless, by the end of the season, Newcastle were ready to move on, but the transfer market would go by without any exciting developments until the very last day. Though Ben Arfa had rejected offers by the likes of Besiktas, as the time was running out, I'm guessing he was getting less and less picky as he'd accept a late offer for a loan at Hull City hours before the closing of the market. It was such a last-ditch effort to get him signed for the club that the player would have to rush to an hotel 
and asked the reception to allow him to use their fax machine in order to get the papers to them in time. As he traveled to Hull by midnight, there were hundreds of fans waiting for their surprise signing, which became a lot funnier after he had to inform the club he was lost and couldn't find the training center. Eventually, they managed to help him and Atem looked cheerful as he leaned out the window to greet the fans. The quotes that came from this moment were more than enough to get the fans excited. Benzema was asked what he thought of the transfer and he would answer that if Atem had followed the path that was designed for him, he would now have been playing alongside Lionel Messi. In technical terms, they're the same, but Atem has other problems. Ben Arfa himself would also not fail to acknowledge the stakes behind this move. He would tell the press, I am under lots of pressure. I feel like my career is a Super Mario game and I've run out of credits. This is my last life. One month after his first match, Hull drew nil-nil against Liverpool and though he had not yet tasted victory with his new side, they sat ninth on the table. And both the fans and the coach were happy with his performances, both on the pitch and in training. I've left it out so far, but one interesting thing about Ben Arfa is that at some point throughout his career, he hired an advisor named Wazin, who followed him everywhere and even lived with him. Their relationship got so close that eventually Ben Arfa stopped contacting his dad, who would later accuse Wazin of stealing his son, which would lead to a heavily publicized altercation that would end with Ben Arfa telling the press that his father had been absent in his childhood, that he lacked affection, and above all, that he never once in his life told him he loved him. Perhaps this troubled father-son dynamic was what led Ben Arfa to develop such a short fuse. All the way back in the Clairefontaine documentary, once he cooled down, he even told the cameras that he gets annoyed very quickly. At Hull, his life was always a matter of concern. He spent his days at home with his advisor playing chess and watching reality shows. Some of the staff even referred to him as a loner or an outcast. The opposite of what you'd expect from a controversial footballer like Atem. Out of nowhere something happened, as Ben Arfa left his home in his Mercedes, he somehow managed to hit a small Fiat that was parked next to it, and it somehow ended up in someone's front lawn. Regardless, he just drove off to training. God knows what was going through his mind, but from here on out, he completely derailed. The next day, he was anonymous in a match, and as Ole slowly entered a relegation battle, everyone began to worry about his lack of ambition. A match against Manchester United, three months after his arrival, was the end. After 35 minutes on the pitch, Hull City coach Steve Bruce began to wonder if his eyes had deceived him. Atem had practically not moved since the start of the match. He asked an analyst to run the numbers and soon it was confirmed. Atem had covered less distance on the pitch than the goalkeeper himself. He was immediately subbed off and informed that he would never again play for Hull City. His loan was broken off early and Newcastle released him. Oddly enough, Ben Arfa would go missing, leaving all of his belongings behind as Hull attempted to move a new player into his house. This wasn't the first time he had left stuff behind as he left in a hurry. In 2008, he left a 90,000 euro check behind as he forgot to clean his locker at the Lyon training center. Still, some fans felt for him. One fan in a message board even said that Steve Bruce acted like someone would buy a kitten and be mad that it won't bark. Now without a club, he looked to find a new one as soon as possible, and in came Nice. As the club announced him on social media, FIFA came knocking, claiming the one appearance he made for Newcastle's under-23 squad was considered an official match, and since no player can play for more than two clubs in the same season, he was forbidden from joining Nice, who would be forced to cancel his contract. He went back to Paris and waited for months, making sure he'd be ready to join Nice again once he was allowed. The player claimed he was willing to go to the North Pole to play football if necessary, and it showed. Over that summer, he built up an impressive routine and despite being out of professional football for so long, by the time it was over, he would be in exceptional shape and Nice would not hesitate for a second on an opportunity to take him back. The Nice coach Claude Puel understood Ben Arfa and his needs. He built a team around him, having players like Ricardo Pereira and Ben Rama join him in his quest to make a legacy for himself and Atem finally had a season that everyone had been waiting for. 23 goals and assists had left the world in awe of what seemed like a Ben Arfa approaching his final form. Nice would finish 4th in the league, though they would miss the Champions League spot. 
The season would provide us with a lot more magic goals, dart-like passes, impossible runs, and a million reasons for big clubs to be on the lookout for Atem Ben Arfa. Over the summer, he was even called up for the national team, but after telling Deshad that he would only come if he could bring alongside him a magnetic therapy practitioner, whatever that is, Deshad decided to just take Coma instead. As the gates of football glory opened up to Ben Arfa, he ultimately had to make a choice between Barcelona and PSG. Being Paris the city of his childhood and having the chance of perhaps taking over the spot of Ibrahimovic, a player who over the last year had frequently been compared with him. Ben Arfa fell in love with the idea of joining them. As the season at PSG went by, the minutes dwindled and Unai Emery was less and less impressed by the player, even as his Coupe de France performances saw him get 3 goals and 6 assists in just 3 matches. Though, to be fair, the fact that Ben Arfa used to frequently humiliate the coach by doing impressions of his peculiar accent in training probably didn't help to encourage him to call up the player. The clock was ticking, and as the season came to an end, Atem turned 30 years old and confirmed what everyone had been expecting. He would forever be the ultimate enfant terrible, a roller coaster of emotions. Even if he was a beautiful mess, there was little hope for Ben Arfa, and soon there would be even less. You see, in an event with some Qatari royalty, Ben Arfa decided to make conversation with one of them by mocking the president of PSG. He was so enraged that he swore Ben Arfa would not play another match for his team, and so it would be more than a year of absence before his next move. You see, there were ways out of this hellhole, but Arfa wanted to squeeze every cent out of the shake before he went on his way. It was his way of avenging himself. He would join Ren and would at first struggle to get the playing time he wanted, but after a managerial change, he was made into a key player for the squad and success would come soon after. He would enjoy another good season, with one moment being particularly sweet. Ren would meet PSG in the final of the Coupe de France and Ben Arfa would have a great performance that would lead Ren to eventually win on penalties. Right after the match ended, Ben Arfa ran to the cameras to tell them you should never underestimate your adversaries, a message that was clearly directed to the Sheikh. To further provoke him, he would even wave his medal as he passed by him. Now that Ben Arfa had gone to war with royalty and won, his career spiraled into what it is today. As many expected him to follow the surefire plan of staying with Ren, he moved to Valladolid at the request of Ronaldo Fenomeno who had recently purchased the club. Unfortunately, the pandemic ruined everyone's plans and would only wear their shirts on only five occasions. Over the last season, he joined Bordeaux, but a lack of chemistry with his teammates led to his untimely exit, leaving everyone still thinking that perhaps he should have stayed with Ren all those years back. Once again, Ben Arfa is without a club, and once again the rumors are heard that at 34 years old, he is officially a wasted talent. But look at his career, so many stories, so many iconic moments, so many twists and turns, he might have failed to make it as an all-time great. But in his own way, he made it. He is not a legend for the Hall of Fame, but Ben Arfa is most definitely a legend in the streets. This was Ben Arfa's career in a video. I hope you enjoyed. If you didn't forget to like and subscribe, it really means the world to me. And yeah, see you next week. Bye.